here and we want to remind you that if you don't remember anything else from this morning, remember God loves you. Remember that he has called you to this place for a reason and we may not know what it is, but his love will show you exactly what that reason is soon. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for holy worship.
Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go round about it, number its towers. Consider well its ramparts, go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation. This is God, our God, forever and ever. God will be our God forever. The First Testament reading this morning is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 14. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hand. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing, appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I can invite uh, your children. Uh, here I am. So, what are you afraid of, Joe? What are you afraid of? Nothing. Nothing? What did you say? Yeah. You're not afraid of anything at all? No. Kind of? Okay, what about you? Uh, beetles. beetles. Well, not beetles, but spiders. Spiders. Not snakes, because I can You touch the snakes? Can you face your fear? Awesome. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm terrified of clouds, that's true. Um, but the cool thing about God is that God helps us to face our fears. So if we're scared of doing something we're supposed to do, God teaches us that we're supposed to trust Him and do it anyway. Are you, either of you scared um, when you came to go to the new place for the first time? You guys came to the church for the first time? Were you a little scared? A little bit? Yeah. See, as a Methodist pastor, my family has to move around. We have to go to a new church like every couple of years. It was really scary for me, especially for my kids. But that's where God has called us. And so we've got to learn to trust Him. So I appreciate you guys being brave and being here at our church with us today. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for showing us what you would want us to do. Thank you so much for giving us the courage. Please cast out the fear that's in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
reading from the Gospel of St. Mark, from chapter 6. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not, all, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he had he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there, until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Uh, and I can read a little bit of our scripture. 
scripture um, this morning before I get back into the sermon. I'm going to repeat some of it so that it can be fresh on our minds. It's from 2 Timothy 1, 5-14. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, be with us now, coming to this space. Interrupt our notions of how this should go. We ask that you would speak truth to our hearts, despite what's set up here. In Jesus' name we pray. In this, the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy, Paul is writing with words of encouragement to his friend who is suffering under persecution for his faith. Timothy has been dealing with hardships for his faith. As he preached to the Ephesians, he encountered a lot of resistance from the government and the community. But Paul does not write him with the kind of sympathy you would expect. In our culture, the custom for someone dealing with with the problems, it's just an encouraging note that says something like, get well soon, or I hope you feel better. But that's not what Paul says to Timothy. Paul begins the letter by reminding Timothy of what he already knows. He says, I am reminding you of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. Paul reminds Timothy that he is a man who has a sincere faith and that his mom and his grandmother raised him up in that faith. Paul begins by saying, now Timothy, remember who you're kin to. Remember what your mama taught you. Don't you go making Grandma Lois look bad. Paul's saying, remember your family because they raised you up in Christ. And then Paul goes on. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. Where did Timothy receive his gifts as a minister? Through the laying on of hands from Paul. This is what we do at ordination. The bishop lays her hands on you and gives you her blessing. This tradition dates back to the beginning of the church, back to Peter. Christ told Peter that he would be the rock on which he builds his church. And he gives Peter the authority to lay his hands on people and set them apart for Christian mission. And so for 2,000 years, this act of ordination has been practiced in the church. Peter laid his hands on Paul, who laid his hands on Timothy, and so on and so forth. And one day, the bishop laid his hands on Dr. Simpson, just like Paul did Timothy. Just like families have a lineage through their bloodline, we also have a lineage through Paul and Peter. This lineage is called the church. So Paul doesn't start this letter trying to make Timothy feel better. He doesn't tell him that he hopes his struggles go away. He reminds Timothy of his responsibility to his calling and to his family. He reminds Timothy that he is part of the church. The church is his true lineage. Now this may seem like an odd question, but I think it's worth asking. What is the church? After all, we have thousands of denominations today all over the world. Are some the church? Are some not? I honestly don't know how to answer that question. While I do believe that some churches teach theology that is truer than other churches do, I don't really know how God evaluates what's church and what's not. But there's something very important that we do know about the church. We know that Christ gave us the church as the primary way to stay in communion with God after Jesus ascended into heaven. 
Jesus left the earth, but he gave us the church, and he sent the Holy Spirit to guide us. The gathering of God's people in the church is the primary way that we stay in contact with God. Christ is gone. He ascended. But we know where we can still find his presence. Here. In the church. This happens in a few different ways. One of the ways that we stay in contact with Jesus is by coming together as a diverse group of people who we call the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. Your presence allows all of us to be in Christ's presence. It takes all of us to be the body. You cannot be the body of Christ alone. We need the body of Christ to see Christ. But another way that we see Christ is through the sacrament of communion. Jesus says, this is my body, broken for you. The Methodist Church believes that God is truly present in our communion. And this is the way that Christ offers himself to us. We can certainly see Jesus outside, in the trees, in the sunsets, but God has primarily re revealed Christ to us here, in the church. Paul does not send Timothy a letter telling him to cheer up. He says, remember your ordination, remember your family, your baptism. Remember the church. The church is your true lineage. What Paul is telling Timothy is that there's nothing more important than his identity as a Christian. There is no vow that he has taken that is more important than his <coughs> baptism and his ordination. Paul did not say, remember your civic duty. He said, remember the church. This is because for the Christian, there is no identity that is more important than the Christian identity. Nothing is more important. For Christians, all other commitments are inferior to their commitments to Christ. We see this in one of the most confusing passages in all of Scripture. Jesus is teaching in the Gospel of Luke, and he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. As we know, Jesus does not want us to hate our families. We know that because we aren't supposed to hate anyone. And we know that because we know he loved his mother very much. However, we do know this. When Jesus told us to hate our families, he was saying that following him was more important than remaining committed to our families. If our families become more important than our faith, we are missing the point of following Christ. Our families are important, but they play a very important and distinct role in the church. For Christians, the primary function of the family is to grow one another towards Christ through the church. If you have a family, God has given you that family so that you can all work together to grow in your faith. If you are a Christian, your family is not the most important thing in your life. Your family is good and important, but they are meant to lead you to follow Christ and to live a life of love and peace with the world. This is what Paul was saying in his letter to Timothy. Your peace, your comfort, your family, all of those things are less important than being faithful to Christian teaching. All of these things are less important than your commitment to the church. Remember your baptism, because the church is your true lineage. 
As you know, yesterday we celebrated Independence Day as a nation. We celebrated the formation of our country. We celebrated our freedom, our American identity. It is good and right to be thankful for our nation and thank God for our freedoms. After all, we are able to worship here today without the fear of the government coming in or terrorists disrupting, shutting us down. Christians in China and India, they don't have that luxury this morning. But we are, of course, so grateful for everyone who helped secure our safety and the ability to worship today. And since yesterday was Independence Day, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a Christian, to have our true Christian lineage while also being a proud and grateful American. For a long time in our nation, we've used Christian language and symbols to talk about our identities as Americans. Throughout our history, it has been common for Americans to do things and talk about the importance of Christian values. And that's why in the 1950s, the words under God were added to the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. It is also why there has never been an American president who did not at least self-identify as a Christian. And that's why there's an American flag behind me today. For a long time, our nation and our church have shared a common language and common values. But of course, we know that we're starting to see things change. Other religions are growing in our country. More and more people are beginning to identify themselves as atheist or agnostic. And as these demographics change, the way that the country identifies with Christianity has changed too. As you know, many public buildings have taken down Christian images and symbols. Prayer at public events is far less frequent than it used to be. And laws that are based in Christian belief systems are being changed to accommodate other people with different belief systems and different values. America is much less comfortable letting Christian language and symbols speak about our identity than it was about 50 years ago. The culture is changing, and as we know, Christianity is not the only voice that is influencing American values. One of the big reactions that American Christians have had to our changing landscape is rooted in fear. We are afraid. We are afraid that other religions will come in and take over. We are afraid that other languages will replace English. We are afraid that Christians will start to see persecution as a result of all of this change. We are afraid of losing power because we are worried that all of that outside influence will hurt us and change us and destroy everything we love. We see the world changing and it makes us afraid. But in times like this, I want to remind you of something very important. It's what Paul told Timothy in our text this morning. The Lord has not given us a spirit of cowardice. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The world is changing. Yes, it is. But God tells us, do not fear. God says, respond with power and love and self-discipline. Paul tells Timothy what he tells us today. Remember where you came from. Remember your true lineage. Fear is not from God. Fear is demonic. The Lord has not given us that fear. Paul and Timothy were facing an insane amount of persecution. What Christians experience today in America doesn't even compare to what they're dealing with. We are afraid because laws are changing that kick us out of power. <clears throat> they lived in a world where Christian laws never existed in the first place. They lived in a world where killing Christians for their faith was incredibly common. 
They were constantly looking over their shoulders, talking about their faith quietly. But despite their constant persecution, Paul told Timothy, the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. Don't be afraid. Be strong. Remember your ordination. Remember your baptism. Remember how your mom and grandma raised you in the faith. Paul was telling Timothy that when you get afraid, you need to remember your true identity. When you were baptized, you were no longer your own. You are God's. God's going to take care of you. Remember your true lineage. God has no lack. No limitations. When the government changes, God is still God. When the people sin, God is still God. God does not lose power when we sin. God is not weakened. God never changes. We do not need to defend God because God will always be God. This is why our allegiance is always first directed towards God. Because countries and governments change. They rise and fall. But the name of the Lord reigns forever. Our commitments are first to God through the church. This is our true lineage. It is in church that we receive our baptism. It is in church that we come into special communion with God. This place with these people. This is your family. This is your government. This is where you find your true identity. The church is our lineage, our namesake. It is how we know who we are. I am so thankful for our freedoms. I'm so thankful that I can worship with you today. But if that ever changes, when we lose our freedoms and our protection, God will still be God. And the church will still be the church. If one day we have to worship in secret, we will still be Christians. God will still be God. Sisters and brothers, God loves you so much. The God who is above all of the fear and all of the worry and all of the change loves you and will protect you. We will still gather to praise his name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. This is what Paul was telling Timothy. Don't be afraid. Jesus is still Lord. Remember your true lineage. Amen.
ourselves as people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from excessive pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law, we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in days of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All which we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin by reading together the prayer on page 8. It says, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we have reconciled with one another in God, let us go to one another and show that to each other by saying, the peace of God be with you.
son, Jesus Christ, who came from David's house. He healed and preached and taught many people, yet he was without honor in his own land, rejected by his own kin. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us the new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. And after he had given thanks for the harvest of wheat, he broke the bread and gave it to us, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took a cup, much like this one. And after he had given thanks to the fruit of the vine, he gave the cup to us, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. gathered there that, hey, everybody, look up here. Something very important is happening. Look, you know. So it's just a kind of a, a neat thing to, we might have the children ring those bells again like we did at uh, Christmas time when they rang the bells and the bread was lifted. The, uh, the blood or the juice, I was thinking about this this weekend, biting into a grape and having the juice run down my lips. And uh, the juice is what keeps us going. Juice in a battery is what keeps the battery going. So we have juice here. We call it wine. It's the fruit of the vine. But it's the nephesh. The Hebrew word is nephesh, meaning life force. It's the life in us that keeps us going. It's the blood. So with the body and the blood of Christ here, in this sacrament, Christ bends down to us. God bends down to us in Jesus and Jesus becomes flesh, walks with us, and becomes a learner with us so that he may unite with humanity 
and raise us up to be with him in resurrection. this together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit.